Welcome to Up Next in Commerce. I'm your host, Stephanie Postles, and you are in for a treat today. I invited Matthew Herman on the show, who's a co-founder and creator of Boy Smells, a queer-owned fragrance and personal product brand. In this episode, Matthew really spilled all the beans when it came to telling me how he's been dealing with the shakeups in the supply chain the past year, and how his industry experience and knowledge really gave him a leg up when building the company. Plus, we got to hear his take on creating genderful products, a term that acts as a mark of inclusion that celebrates gender expression instead of removing it from the conversation. I love his perspective on this and his journey to building up Boy Smells and think there were so many valuable nuggets in this one that can be applied to almost any business. Enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. I'm your host, Stephanie Postal, CEO at mission.org. Today on the show, we have Matthew Herman, who's the co-founder and creator of Boy Smells. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's yeah, I'm pleasure to be here. Dive into this. When I was first looking through my prep doc, I was like, "Boy smells." What is that? So I really want to kind of just start there with like, "What is Boy Smells?" and how did you come about creating this? Yeah, for sure. Um, boy smells is called boy, but we are packaged in pink. So, um, kind of just poking fun at this idea that like scent should be assigned certain scents are assigned to genders it's kind of begs the question it's like well what's a boy supposed to smell like like why is pink wait pink's not supposed to be for boys like what why is pink just for girls you know and kind of provoking just kind of pokes fun at like some kind of uh expectations i guess that are embedded in the social fabric around like gender and scent, et cetera. And, you know, creating this brand came at a time in my life where I was kind of opening myself up to um, kind of tear down some of those, you know, uh, I guess, boundaries that come with expectations around identity and gender for myself as I was trying to like I embrace a more holistic true version of myself so at that time i was wearing like a lot of floral scents because like that's what made me feel like my best and baddest self and uh you know i was working in the fashion industry before i started working in the fragrance industry and my girlfriends were all wearing super masculine scents like Tuscan leather by Tom Ford or Santal 33 by La Labo and it kind of was like I don't know, like the boyfriend blazer, the chunky Rolex of, you know, in, in, in olfactive, uh, sense. And, you know, I was doing the opposite and even right before like a big meeting where you have to like present or you like see the CEO or the president or whatever, you know, people are like, just, you know, put a spritz of fragrance on it kind of like imbues them with a sense of like confidence and power and i thought that that was so interesting that my girlfriends were like reaching across that binary aisle to like encapsulate this kind of more like masculine masculinity to it and then i was reaching across the aisle to like bring in this femininity to make me feel or each of us and all of us to feel like more powerful and i truly believe that you know being able to tap into your masculinity and your femininity simultaneously makes you a more well-rounded, fully realized individual. And I think that there's power on both sides of that spectrum. And so uh, that's kind of what the boy smells name and the the mixing of the color and the name, you know, you can't pull them apart um, without it. You can't, you don't understand the full, like spectrum of like what our belief system is if you take away like the pink color from the boy smells so on paper it's a little confusing but when you see the branding in real life it's a little bit more kind of like poking a hole and peeking behind the curtain of like what we're taught and how we're taught to see ourselves and what kind of limitations we put on ourselves because of what society tells us yep i love that okay so when you're thinking of all these ideas and you're like i have this you know, brilliant plan to make a product that's going to question the narrative that we've kind of, you know, all heard growing up. What was the next step? Because I mean, it feels daunting to be like, I have a lot of like a really big plan here. And now like, how do I actually make the product and get into it? And I mean, what does that look like for you? Yeah, totally. So honestly, we started making candles for fun and for friends, like okay. on the weekends and like giving them to coworkers and just kind of like messing around. 
I was working as a design director at Nasty Gal, um, and that's why I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, my partner, David, was working in production at Elder Statesman, which is a luxury cashmere company. And I think we were kind of like wanting to get off that hamster wheel of like, you know, new product every month. Like, you know, here's 40 dresses and we're launching that 40 dresses 12 times a year and just kind of like, oh my God, it's just like so much product. And it feels like almost like a, a waste of like creative mm-hmm. output to like yeah. be on that hamster wheel. And David was doing the same in production with kind of a same kind of cycle there. So we really wanted to work on product that had kind of a lasting impression. You know, the six, the first six candles that we launched, I believe that five of them are still in the range and we and some of them are still our best sellers you know so like we made that and it's lasted five years and we still get to you know um share that and people still get to discover that Mm -hmm. every day and it's so much more kind of like a rewarding process to create like a product that like has a much longer lifespan um And so, you know, we just kind of started putting, you know, one foot in front of the other, made them for friends. David, with his production background, was really good at like figuring out like the wax, the wick, you know, all like the manufacturing and, you know, kind of science behind it. I was great at creating fragrances. Together, we came up with the branding and we just bought boxes. We bought the glass, we put it together and we just kind of put it out into the world to see if it would resonate. And, you know, we didn't write some, I, I, I'm like kind of embarrassed to say, but like, we never wrote some big business plan and we were never like, we're going to disrupt gender values and fragrance. You know, we were just like doing what was natural to us. We were like Mm -hmm. two queer individuals. And we were just like, you know, we were kind of like reclaiming and redefining what it meant for us to be proud, like men or guys or boys, you know, and like kind of reclaiming, like like what that space could mean for us and like loving the color pink and like loving floral scents. And we just literally, David was like, what should we call it? And I just turned around. I was like, let's call it boy smells. And then we got the papers. I was like, that'd be cool. Let's put it in pink because that's like really weird, you know? And then it wasn't like this big premeditated thing, but as the brand took off and we saw like how much people loved it, we realized that like, you know, poking fun at these kind of expectations around identity is really us saying like, come shop at boy smells because like we stand for being released from all of those expectations. We stand for being released from, you know, like the pressures that you might feel to fit into somebody else's box. Like we are a path to living authentically no matter what anybody else cares about and um it just took off like way faster than we ever could have imagined and you know uh six months in david quit his job 12 months in we hired our first employee 18 months in i quit my full-time job and those were all really scary things because you know i i had a very I, like only this year did I like started <laughs> paying myself the same amount that I made before we started this company. And it's been five years. So, you know, it was a long time of just kind of, you know, plugging away at it. Um, we started the whole business in our house, no overhead for an office. We didn't pay ourselves for the first two years. So no real like overhead as far as um, head count or human capital went And so um, we really put every single cent made back into more inventory and then so that we could open more stores, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And because of our backgrounds in the fashion industry, we just had a bunch of like great things happen early on, like um, by George in Austin, Um, they carry, they were like the first retailer of our candles because my friend bought by George from the original owners, like right around that time. And I was like, I'm just going to drop off like, the collection at your house let me know if y'all want to buy it and that and then when i worked at nasty gal um the buyer for dresses because i was like running the dress department um for in design was a girl named uh lisa and she started a a company called lisa says ga which is like an online retail like fashion retailer so when she left nasty gal i sent her the candles i was like hey would you ever consider selling these on your store so 
Also at that time, like people from 10 over six were consulting at by George. And so 10 over six brought it in. And so kind of like right after we launched, we were in these like kind of like really directional fashion boutiques mm-hmm. that a lot of other stores and buyers look to as to like what they're carrying, et cetera. So we had like kind of like a halo effect early on of like really cool stores carrying the brand. And that like took us very far and gave other stores confidence to like buy into us. And so yeah, you get that um, first logo, first brand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're good. I mean, what I also think is so interesting about your story is that so many people, you know, probably even listening are working within companies. And to me, I feel very like, kind of like you, like you're within an industry, learn as much as you can. And then that's where a lot of business ideas can come. Yeah. And right now it's like so many people maybe coming out of school or just kind of like, I want to start a business right away. And I always think like the best lessons I ever had and like why I even can own a business now is because I worked at, you know, the Googles and even the Fannie Mae's and the places that maybe back then I didn't really see a path. But once yeah. you start kind of like uncovering secrets and be, you know, becoming very entrepreneurial, that's the best way to kind of put you on a path to, you know, actually know you know, the ins and outs of that industry, just like you, where you're like, well, now I already, you know, had a friend here and knew how to do this here and knew what to ask for and knew the language to use, which is so important. Absolutely. And I've worked at places that have, you know, um, been less successful at times, Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, I worked in super high end runway fashion during, you know, uh, you know, the economic downturn Mm -hmm. and, like that was a big eye opener. Like, what does it take to stay afloat when like nobody's yeah. buying luxury goods and like everyone's just trying to keep their house, you know, yeah. like, like how do, how do you pivot a business? Like at nasty gal, I was there through like the, the high highs and some of the low lows. And I saw like, you know, what were, what were some of the recipes for success? What were some of the recipes um, that were less successful? What were the opportunities that maybe like, uh, nobody saw that we could have taken advantage of, et cetera. And so I'm extremely thankful um, for all of the skill sets that I developed, you know, along the way that I never would have had. Like, this sounds like crazy, but when I was a fashion designer, I was working um, at Zach Posen, I was running the design team and I was running the atelier. And what it's like, right before a fashion show and you have like 200 garments to have like sewn cut and made and you have like 20 sewers and you have two factories out of house etc cetera, etc cetera, and you have all these moving parts and you were just like you know looking at the whole puzzle piece coming together with a hard deadline mm-hmm. like all of those skills i rolled straight into like pandemic voicemails it's like our factory was shut down. Our glassware factory was shut down. Like our pink paper came from Northern Italy. And all of a sudden we were like setting up, you know, people who worked in candle factories, we were like setting up home offices for them with fold out tables and wax melters and fragrance and dropping them off. And it was basically the exact same job Mm -hmm. that I had of like getting garments made for a fashion show, but like, all the time, you know, trying to get candles made during the pandemic when everything was shut down and people had to isolate. And I'm so thankful. And that's just like one example, but I, I am a huge advocate to learn as much as you can from other people's successes and other people's failures, be a part of those teams Mm -hmm. and then roll those skill set into, you know, starting your own company. I didn't start voicemails until I was 34 and that's i had a wealth of professional experiences that led up to that that totally informed how we navigate through this you know solo journey of ours yeah that's great okay so how many employees do you have now there are 15 of us now um but uh (laughs) we expect to be 30 people by this time next year which is crazy um and slightly terrifying but also really exciting because every time we like bring somebody else on it feels a little daunting because our bandwidth is like totally maxed out Mm -hmm. so i think that a lot of people get in this pace or in this place where they're scaling quickly where they scale quickly then the idea of onboarding somebody feels like a monumental task because you have no time to develop that person. And I think that's a very dangerous place to get, but it's a necessary place to be when you're like a small brand self-funded because you, 
there's not like a ton of disposable cash to burn and like bring on a bunch of people before the growth happens. You're always like backfilling, uh, you know, after the growth. So, um, but every time we bring somebody else on, I see like the relief of pressure, you know, we kind of like left that pressure valve release a little bit, our bandwidth, it, it, you know, increases, then we grow into that capacity, Mm -hmm. the business grows with it, then we bring on more people. So, um, and if you bring on the right people too, to me, that's like the biggest lesson I've learned over the past couple of years is like, you're investing a lot as a company to just mm-hmm. bring one person on and yourself running the company, you have to train them and then your team's training them. And like, there's a lot that goes into every new person. Mm-hmm. And if you bring on the wrong person and then like three months later, you're like, oh, this isn't really working. I mean, to me, it takes three months to scale someone up usually. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Once I started realizing like if you, the level of talent, if you bring on someone who's better than you, better than anyone on the team, like that's when you really can, you know, not be as worried about every new headcount. Uh, whereas in yeah. the early days, it's like, let me go for someone who's a little less expensive and I can train them up. And now I'm like, no, they, they need to train me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we find that a lot because, you know, David and I come from a fashion background. We hired a CEO this year, also comes from a fashion back, fashion and accessories apparel background. And, um, you know, we need functional experts in fragrance and beauty because that's the area in which we're playing. And we kind of you know, filled the house with a lot of fashion people, which I love because we treat this candle brand and fragrance brand like it's a fashion company. I think that's what sets us apart because we like, that's all we know. That's the only way we know how to market a product. That's the only way we know how to like exist in like our creative output. But um, we do need like for operations, um, you know, research and development, product development, production, you know, we really need like, you know, functional expertise that come from the beauty industry because you know those are the connections that's the technical knowledge that we really need in order for ourselves to be successful Mm -hmm. so when it comes to hiring a ceo like what was the thoughts behind that what did it actually look like because you hear a lot of both sides like you hear companies hiring ceos and you're like "Uh oh like what's happening over there when they change ceos and other times you see it it works out beautifully you're like that was a good call like what, yeah. what were you guys thinking around that? How'd it go? I wish like I, I wish I always had like much better, like these like much more premeditated, like I put this grand plan into place and like and then we execute on it. But um, as is the case with a lot of voice wells, like, you know, it just kind of happened um serendipitously. So um my parents uh, moved to Mexico part time and uh, in a town called San Miguel de Allende. And, you know, there was another uh, American who had a home in San Miguel who a lot of people suggested that I meet. And his name was David Duplantis. And he, um, uh, you know, was spent 14 years at coach and, uh, left as a president and was part of like the senior, senior leadership team there and really developed like, like was in charge of like store, uh, planning, merchandising, e-commerce, consumer experience, uh, uh, social media, like really like, you know, like a lot of things laddered up to him. Mm -hmm. And so I met him once when he was back in New York and I was in New York because he, his primary residence was in New York and we just had breakfast one day and then we stayed in touch and I started getting his opinion on certain things. And then he just started kind of like being this fairy godfather to us and like was consulting for us at no, no cost or charge to us just as like, friends he was um kind of in a space where he was really focused on mentoring other people as just a you know a personal reward to him and um as we developed and decided to do a search for senior leadership i kind of let him know that we were considering this to try to get his advice on like the best way to go about it secretly hoping that he would ask to be considered for the position and he did and so um it just really happened very very organically we never actually did an official set it out to search or anything Mm -hmm. but um we had the advantage of working with david for 18 months before you know he came on as ceo yeah so he already knew all the ins and outs and had ideas around exactly what he would do anyways probably (laughs) Yeah, we didn't we didn't have to present like the best versions of ourselves. He already knew what he was getting into uh, when he signed up. But I think that's like 
who it's rare that people get that opportunity to work together for so long before making that decision. And I think it would be very daunting to have to pick a CEO after just meeting somebody two or three times or four times or off of paper or whatever. So um, we feel really lucky that we had that. Yeah, that's great. So I want to talk a bit about your business model. Cause I think you started as wholesale, you pivoted to D 2 C mm -hmm. and then you were mentioning earlier, you know, you guys are making a big push into retail and mm -hmm. I want to kind of hear about the evolution and you know, what it looked like every step of the way. Yeah. I mean, I think like when you talk to any like financial advisor, right. They're like diversify your portfolio. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. to like, you know, you'll avoid the most risk because like when certain things do well, you know, and other things don't do as well, you have that opportunity and, you know, the pendulum is always shifting. So, uh, you know, coming from high fashion backgrounds, you know, and that being our previous experiences, we really like kind of leaned into a wholesale model. Um, me nor David really come from super, even though I worked at SEL, like I was on the design team, I wasn't part of like, you know, the digital team, you know? So the wholesale, uh, I was more familiar with the wholesale model and like at least executing on it. So we really leaned into that in the first couple of years. And then, um, you know, we saw like exponential growth, exponential growth. And then one year we had like a little bit less growth than we had hoped for, um, still triple digits. We, we've never had a year without triple digit growth, but, um, wow. But that year was a little bit less than we were expecting. So we went into the pandemic here. We went into, you know, um, 2020 with uh, deciding to really invest in digital. We hired our first digital advertise, digital marketing team, which set, sits out of house. Um, we uh, invested in internal marketing resources and assistance in house. Um, and we kind of went into 2020, like knowing that that's where we were going to invest our money. And it wasn't a huge investment, but you know, to us, it felt like a huge investment at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so we rolled January that started February of that year. We had a uh, slow burn, which is our Casey Musgraves collab, which nice. was kind of our, like, we've had a successful products like with Kush and other candles but like this was our first like crazy big like immediate sellout product that we'd ever had mm -hmm. um and then it sold out like in an hour or something like that and wow. then we did like a pre-sale like a week later and like we ended up like pre-selling twenty thousand units or something crazy um Gosh. you know that's that we awesome though yeah so you guys like yes like were you, <laughs> how much were you celebrating when you were seeing these numbers um I was so excited, but I was also like, you know, careful what you wish for. We were like, um, we've never had to produce like 20,000 units of one skew mm -hmm. and like as quickly as possible ever yeah. before in our lives. It totally took us by surprise. I think we yeah. ordered like 2,500 units for the first one. And we were like, this will last us like three months, you know, wow. like uh -huh. <laughs> totally didn't see it coming. Um, and then three weeks after that, we were in lockdown, mm -hmm. you know? And so at which basically, if you look at like our, our D to C numbers from like March 12th through March 19th of, of last year, which is like when all the lockdown orders went into place, it was literally like, doo -doo 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 -doo. like, it was just like, literally people were like, Oh, I'm stuck at home for an undisclosed amount of time. I'm going to need a candle for this. I, wanna, I want things to smell good around me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, at the same time, like that pink paper that I was talking about, that comes from Northern Italy, shut down. Our glassware comes from China, shut down. Our candle factory, like after two, two weeks after lockdown got shut down. So oh like totally nuts, but our D to C channel did grow a thousand percent in 2020 which so, is like what were you guys doing though you have all these sales coming in it sounds like your entire like supply chain gone like yeah we were we were that? getting glassware domestically we were um printing our pink box we were printing that color pink mm -hmm. on white boxes which you never done for the first time because that i i like 
even though every single other brand in the entire world prints color on white, um, I hate seeing like the white edge on yeah. the like on like the box or something I like love that. Your attention to detail. You're just my style. Yeah, I know. Our our, our production team hates me, but yeah. um, <laughs> but like so we we did we cut a few corners, I guess you know, or not cut corners. We we reimagined our supply chain in a way that could support the business during that time period, mm -hmm. and then our team was like insane and so scrappy literally renting u-haul vans dropping off oils glass and boxes at people's garages buying them wax melters buying them fold out tables wow. so people really had like work from home candle factories and we were doing that also ourselves at our home and at our office and you know we were finding third-party logistic companies to that were still shipping essential goods to like co-pack and ship out all of our candle orders and things like that. So um, we basically like kind of threw out all of our systems and just like got super scrappy with like pencil and paper. And we're just kind of like, you know, making it work every single day. Um, and then of course things slowly started to reopen. So we kind of went from like throwing out the playbook to coming out the other side a very different company and at a very different size with like a very with a much larger customer pool and like having grown d to c muscle mass that like didn't even exist anymore so once we kind of came out of it and came up for breath we were like we basically have to rebuild our organization from scratch because like we never established best practices Mm -hmm. for a brand new business model or even like reassigned roles and responsibilities like you know it was like totally chaotic and, and fun and i'm so proud of our team so yeah. i think we're still rebuilding into the organization that we need to be coming out of the pandemic because it grew so quickly and then of course like that shift we're now seeing like we became so popular in ddc during the pandemic that coming out of the pandemic and with the you know resurgence of interest in home fragrance you know when we're now you know nordstrom has put us into all 100 doors we have you know across the pond and at space and k in the uk we're in like i think 35 doors there there's just been like many many much more large scale um wholesale opportunities so we're seeing a really 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 big growth in wholesale this year um oh way above 100 percent growth um and then in d to c i think we're looking at like 90 percent growth for this year so still yeah crazy yeah. um but congratulations um, that's great <laughs> thanks but not quite the 1000 percent growth of uh -huh. last year <laughs> i mean yeah that's that's still epic though what were maybe when thinking about the shift that you had to make really quickly you know, you hear of some companies who are maybe kind of going back to the way they were doing things before, where everything was kind of overseas and they're kind of mm -hmm. moving back to that model. And then you hear of other companies who are like, I kind of see a new way of doing it now and I'm gonna stick with half of these things. Mm -hmm. What what did you guys do? Are there certain things that you, you know, quickly pivoted to over the past year or two that you're like, Oh, actually this is a new way of doing it and there's no reason to maybe go back to the old way? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the pandemic is kind is like still here with us you know um i'm sure you know boy smells is not unique in the fact that our raw materials sit off port waiting to dock and get unloaded for yeah. three to six weeks where they Weird use in every interview yeah i know it's i'm sure you're sick of hearing it it's like a broken record but you no, know some people actually tell me how to solve it though which is also kind of interesting i have heard a couple of guests kind of leaning into their retail partners to basically mm -hmm. say hey can we be a part of your shipment walmart so then you can get us here because they maybe have the entire cargo ship so i've heard some interesting strategies amazing has been kind of cool to be like hey maybe other brands should lean into this if they can if they have the order quantity or the partnership there i'm gonna have to look listen to the backlog of interviews um yes we're basically um planning inventory just a lot further out um so you know you know adding six to eight weeks onto all of our lead times for raw materials is um necessary but it also means that we have to scrape back six to eight weeks on all of our product development and research and development mm -hmm. so um you know we've shifted launch dates a lot this year um we're launching our holiday collection on november 1st which is super exciting but 
you know, we had a plan to launch it like in early October. Um, mm-hmm. So that that whole collection moved out a month. Um, we just launched a new Phantom collection, um, which is super exciting. But, you know, we had to air in the first batch of inventory for that, which is so expensive. Air, airing in glassware is like mm-hmm. not fun. Um, so <laughs> I can only imagine like and half of it is broken. Yeah. <laughs> had a little turbulence. <laughs> It's not that it's more like, oh, it costs 20 cents a unit to do it by boat or it costs two dollars a unit to do it by air. So, you know, we're seeing like huge, you know, margin erosion by like Mm -hmm. being having to air anything in. So but also like we want to air in the minimum amount possible because we want to like, you know, we want to protect our margin as much as possible. So we aired in what we thought would be enough, but the collection was like a way bigger hit than we thought. So like it sold out i think in a week and then we sat with no inventory for two weeks and we thought that initial inventory would last us a whole month it only lasted three a week and then we didn't have another production run coming for another two weeks so you know i'm sure our customers um have or i guess we are conscious of the fact that we do not want to cause any kind of irritation with our customers or any kind of like lack of confidence that will be in stock of mm-hmm. certain items that they, they won't receive things on time if they buy it from us at a certain time. So, um, you know, just trying to like, we're trying to just get in front of things and be proactive with our communication, try to be like transparent and honest with our customers as to why these delays are happening. And that's kind of like, you know, um, we're still kind of living in that pandemic um, situation, but I will have to say, if we hadn't have gone through this last year, like the shipping delays last year, I don't think anybody knew that like UPS, FedEx, DHL, you know, USPS would be so kind of like crumbling under the weight of, you know, just monumental shipping that, you know, was happening last year because nobody was traveling. Everybody was ordering things online and we navigated so many customer service issues with delayed shipments oh, for a holiday last year. And like, that was super tough, but like we get to take all of those learnings with us and totally like have so much of a better customer journey this year than they did last year. Um, so I think like any tough time, you just like get smarter and you like grow your tool set. And then you just take that with you to like, to, to the next adventure. Yep. I agree. So the one thing I wanted to talk about too was around your products because I love it where you were kind of talking about your products are kind of evergreen and you don't want to have to be releasing like a new one, you know, Mm -hmm. every single month and, you know, getting bogged down in that. I mean, to me, if I had a product company, it would be that style. Like, how can I make a product evergreen and be here 10 years from now? So I'm not always having to like, you know, think about new things. Like my gift here, I want to be able to have it keep giving for a long time. But how do you think about introducing new things, new partnerships, and then also keeping your baseline of products also relevant? I mean, are you adjusting the marketing around it? Like, how do you keep both of them, you know, top of mind for customers? Yeah. So I, 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 our product pyramid is what I would call it is not unique to boy smells, um, mm-hmm. but it is might be unique, I guess, to candles, which we didn't really see when we entered the market is that we have top of the pyramid is like a super pinnacle collab sells out quickly um you know in and out lots of buzz halo effect then we have the middle of our pyramid seasonal products seasonal collections they might stay for three to six months and then we have our core business which is the bottom of the pyramid it's the foundation of our business and it should be the biggest part of our business Um, and we really kind of follow that cadence. So, um, things like slow burn or our collaboration with Donnie, that's like really driving buzz, press excitement. Then we have like our holiday collection, our phantom collection. We do a collection for pride. We do a collection in the spring. That's really driving kind of that seasonal seasonal sales. And then we have our black and pink candles, which are always in stock. You, it's always replenishable. Like it's tried and true. Those are kind of like the things that people like fall in love with and burn in their homes at all times. So, you know, we realize that we can't grow at the rate that we want to without seasonal collections because mm-hmm. it is what drives interest. It's like what drives press. It drives, 
you know, um, earned media, but, you know, our core business is really the tried and true sense. And we've had to, to make hard decisions about our core collections. You know, there are things that were in limited collections that we know are better sense, that we know are more commercial, that then graduate into core. And then we have to like, you know, with surgical precision, uh, you know, take away low performing SKUs in our core collection. So while the core collection is, um, kind of tried and true, it does evolve as our customer evolves, as tastes evolve, et cetera. And really the goal is like, if something's like amazing in seasonal, the end goal is for it to graduate into our core collection. And if anything is like a low performing skew for, you know, a year or so, then we will have to kind of like drop it out of the collection, which does some cause irritations because there's always a cohort of fans and of like some scent that you know isn't as popular for others but um those are the tough decisions that we have to make and they're the best things for the business and that's our responsibility as business owners yeah i love that so the other thing i want to touch on was like your marketing strategy around maybe connecting with new customers versus current ones Mm -hmm. because i know one of your strategies was around the term genderful was like a mark of inclusion i haven't heard that term before Mm -hmm. and so to me i'm like that's such a like you guys have such a good brand story to tell and so much education around just your brand and you that could be told to new customers, bringing them in that way. How do you kind of, you know, view that when it comes to like marketing the company? Like, how do you use that? So, you know, genderful is a term that is a positive, right? Unisex, uh, non-binary, gender less. Those are all kind of like double negative or they're negatives. And so, gender full really is like a positive. It's a celebration of Mm -hmm. boundless identities that go, you know, that lap over the lines and the confines of guardrails that society expects us to adhere to, to, I don't know, placate the history of gender or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really about like living your fullest and most authentic and true self. Um, so that could be Casey Musgraves being a liberal, uh, woman writing and producing her own music in the super conservative voice club of country music, Mm -hmm. you know, country music radio won't even play her music because she doesn't like kowtow to like the powers that be or whatever. Um, I think we all saw like, also like the Grammys aren't nominating her for country music, uh, Mm -hmm. album of the year because it doesn't like fall within these specific parameters. I mean, same for little Nas X, you know, um, it can also mean during our pride collections, we get to work with Simone or got Mick from RuPaul's drag race, but we actually got to like photograph got Mick as Cade, um, which is their, you know, uh, their true identity, um, having transgendered, uh, you know, we thought it was really important to like represent them, um, as their out of drag persona. Um, also, uh, our last Pride collection, we got to photograph Tommy Dorfman, um, Brandon Flynn, Lena Bloom. So, you know, it can either mean, you know, celebrating, um, expanding the expectations of your gender. Um, it can mean celebrating a spectrum of gender that really exists in the world. Or it can mean cultivating internally, like, a sense of identity where you're not, um, you know, amputating any set part of your personality or access any part of your personality just because you feel the societies to feel the pressures from society to be one way or another way. And as a queer man, individual, uh, you know, he, him, they, them pronouns, um, either one work, you know. I often found myself kind of like backing into a sense of identity that was not only true to myself, but also good for everyone else. So it was like kind of like a version of me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's really important. And I think everybody resonates with that, right? That's not just like a queer person thing. That's like for everyone. Everyone's always like navigating like who am I versus who does everybody else want me to be Mm -hmm. and um gender fullness is really just about like tearing down 
like these fake walls that exist so that you can like fit into other people's ideas, comfortable ideas of like who you should be. And I love that we're like living in a day and age where like, I don't know, Harry Styles is a straight man on the cover of Vogue wearing a dress, you know, or that, you know, that pose is like nominated for Emmys and like is one of the number one shows on TV. Um, you know, it's just, um, I think it's exciting that like queer kids don't even like come out anymore. You know, it's yeah. like not even like required, yeah. you know? And so for me, like gender fullness is really, you know, gender less, like basically avoids the topic altogether. It neuters identity a little bit. Um, so if you think of gender less as kind of like a linen, like painter smock or shift dress, you know, like gender fullness is like patterns and colors it's like yeah. christian lacroix times dries van noten it is like a world where it's really about like using all of the paints and all the colors in the paint box to like paint the most full picture of who mm -hmm. you are and we just happen to make candles now with that we <laughs> yeah. mix traditionally masculine and feminine scent notes together to encourage a more like spectral view of identity and also to hopefully cultivate that within yourself when you wear or burn one of our fragrances in your home but we see potential for that to like go into the bathroom go into apothecary go into self-care go into beauty and like boy smells um we just happen to make candles right now but like we really see a much bigger brand for our future because like the bathroom is such a gendered space, right? Like I grew up kind of being like, these are the things on my dad's vanity. These are the things on my mom's vanity. And it was like, I remember my mom had this like one powder from like, you know, I probably sent it with like violets or something. And it was like from France and it just seemed so fancy. And I loved it, but I was like, I was like, knew it was kind of dangerous. Cause I knew I like, I wasn't supposed to like those things, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, I, I love the idea of like kind of pulling back a lot of those like like uh, gender identifier and like, you know, moments in the bathroom because like no one's as no one's as feminine as dub body wash. No one's as masculine as Old Spice. Like and nobody probably wants to be. And yeah. like, I don't know. I don't like when you brush your teeth, no one's like, oh, man, I, I really identify with this mint toothpaste. But if you know, you're genderful. Maybe your toothpaste is like rose and pink peppercorn flavored. And like, you're like, wow, like this was a, this yeah. was an affirming moment for me, you know, when it usually would have just been like a throwaway moment. And I think that, um, that's what excites me. And I think that's what excites our company to like, keep going and keep growing is to like bring permission to people to be their fullest selves. Um, and if we can do that through the little rituals in our day, I think that that is very, very powerful and, and very exciting. Um, and I don't want to get like too carried away with it because I, I know we, you know, at the end of the day, we're selling stuff. But, you know, for me personally, like I wish a brand like Boy Smells had existed when I was younger because I think I would have found it like important. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think you should lean more into that. I feel like you should be the spokesperson to this movement. Yes, you also sell products, but to me, I haven't heard someone speaking so eloquently in a way that actually is very inclusive to everyone. Like you mm -hmm. said, a lot of terms can feel very divisive and like it doesn't feel like it's in a way that's bringing everyone together. And I love the way that you speak about that in a way that like anyone can get excited. No one can be, you know, against the idea of like be your full self. Doesn't matter who you are, like embrace it. You can love whatever you want. So. Anything, I think, I'd say lean more into that because I haven't heard people talk in a way like you do. Well, thank you. Um, I find it super exciting. And I think that gender inclusion is something that a lot of brands, especially in the self-care and beauty space, struggle with how to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, and I think gender fullness is like a really beautiful word to kind of encapsulate a world where like everybody's invited to the party yeah. and seen for the person that they want to be seen as and celebrated for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
you know and showing that everyone's kind of struggling too it doesn't matter who you are like people have had those feelings doesn't mm-hmm. matter where you've been how you grew up like i'm sure people have felt these feelings at one point in their life i, think, I think oftentimes it's like oh these people feel this way and you've never felt this before and it's like here it is coming together like everyone has struggled in some way everyone probably wants to feel more authentic and be themselves why don't yeah. we go together yeah exactly i think it's a universal experience at some point in your life that you have not been seen for the way that you see yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, you know, a very painful feeling to go through and, um, and it can be damaging, you know, to how you present yourself for the rest of your life. Um, so, and I think the more that people can have a sense of permission, the more that they can feel seen, even if that's through the products that they surround themselves with, I think that that is cool. Yep. I do too. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed sitting here and hanging out today. Where can people find out more about boy smells and get a candle? Yes, of course. So uh, you can go to www.boysmells.com, which is going to have um, the latest and greatest to shop. You can find us at uh, B O Y underscore underscore S M E L L S on Instagram. You can find us in every Nordstrom uh, in North America. And we are also opening our first ever pop-up store in Culver City in Los Angeles at the Platform uh, Shopping Complex, um, which we're super excited about. And that will open on November the 4th. Amazing. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thank you. Take care.